Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today I want to mount the control board for the Formbra upgrade printer, but instead of just printing it out and slapping it on a frame, I want to show you a little bit more than that. So I'm going to run through seven great design tips and tricks to help you designing in CAD for 3D printing. Specifically, of course, we're going to be looking at PCB related things, such as the Big Tree Tech control board, which I'm going to be using as an example. This is going to be really useful for anyone looking to upgrade their printer with a new control board which requires a different mount and therefore some sort of way to screw it to the frame or anyone designing their printer from scratch and needing some way to mount a control board. So without further ado, let's get stuck into it. So the first thing we're going to look at is reference geometry. This is my favorite thing and probably the most important. Reference geometry is where you take data that already exists in 3D, probably real life, and you put it into your CAD model so you can design around it. In this case, it would be, for example, the Big Tree Tech GTR, the actual physical control board. But when you're doing this, don't try and model every little detail. We want the key features which are important for the design. So this will be the overall size, so the kind of square shape around the edge the mounting holes, anything that you need to put screws through in order to hold it to something else, and probably some of the larger components, where cables are gonna stick out, etc. You don't need to model every tiny little diode and resistor on the board or the PCB traces. That's really not gonna affect our mechanical design for the enclosure. Now that we've got the reference geometry sorted, the next thing that I like to do, number two, is to do this great offset starter sketch. I'm not sure of a better way to name it, but that's basically what I do. So with this PCB all laid out as it is, we take a line and offset it on each side individually and dimension each of those four lines. This is basically the space around the control board which we're going to have within the enclosure. Once you've done that, you can extrude the box and use the shell feature to create it into something that looks a little bit like an enclosure. The reason I use this starter sketch style in this exact way is that very often as you go through design, you might find that you need a little bit more room here, a little bit more room there, maybe a little bit less, and you want to be able to just change where the position of those walls are without moving all the features on it. So as long as you are parametrically designing onto those walls, so you're using the reference uh, of those walls when fixing features to it, when you then go back to your starter sketch and move the wall out maybe two millimeters, all your features will move, it, move with it, and you'll get that extra two millimeters that you're after. Number three is to focus first on the base and then do the lid afterwards. It can be very easy to try and get stuck into doing the whole thing at once and then cutting it to make both things. And it just gets really complicated because you've got an inside and an outside and trying to view the right things at the right time becomes really arduous and quite difficult. It also means that your parametric features often get muddled in between each other, between the lid and the base, and then you modify a fillet or something and the whole thing just becomes a bit of a mess. What I like to do is start with the base, go all the way through it as far as I can, and then start with the lid, and then do the modification features that I need to the base in order to hold the lid to it. This keeps all the kind of design stages sort of separate, and it means when you're modifying maybe part of the parametric base, you don't have to worry about the geometry of the lid randomly changing as well. It will just focus on that part. My fourth tip today is to use thinner walls than you might expect. It's very easy in CAD to make things thicker and bigger than they really need to be because you don't have that tangible feeling of what that thickness really feels like, what it really looks like, how much space you really have. Although you can obviously use all the dimensions in the world, our brains just generally don't really work like that. It's useful to have something in your hands to understand that sizing. So what I would urge you to do is try walls that are thinner than you might be looking at. Something around three millimeters is probably the maximum that you need. Once you have very thin walls, it can be difficult to put features on them though. So what I would suggest doing is emboss features out of that wall in order to put features in. So for example, on the design I'm doing here, I have this thin wall, but I need to put a zip tie in. A zip tie trick, which I will show you in a minute. But there's not enough space. I don't think I'm gonna be happy with exactly how it sits. So I'm gonna emboss this feature out the side and that will give a ledge for the cables to kind of sit on and face the right way and be easy to interact with and it just means that that wall feature is not going to be a problem now. So number five is the very easy zip tie trick. It can be quite difficult to visualize how you're going to put a slot into a model that will ensure that a zip tie can be pushed in one side and just curl around and come out the other. 
Some people may find this easy, others may not. So I'm going to show you a very easy trick and how you can design for multiple zip tie features, put them all over your parts and it'll be very easy. What you need to do is first identify the location that you want that zip tie to go. And also if you need to emboss any more material, you need to put that in first. Once you've done that, find a sketch that's parallel to where you want that feature to be. It doesn't have to be perfectly on the place where you want it, just a plane that's parallel. Once you start that sketch, make sure you're referencing the previous geometry, pulling forward the features that are going to influence the position of the zip tie. And then you just need to draw two circles, a small one and one slightly larger. The small one can probably be in the region of four to six millimeters, depending on the curvature and stuff that you need for your specific design. The separation between the two walls can be around two, two and a half, maybe three millimeters, depending on the size of the zip tie you have. Once you've got those two circles sorted, you're pretty much there for the sketch. Now you just need to do a cut extrude. So you select the area which you want to cut, offset to the position where you want to start cutting, and then cut a certain distance. It's as simple as that. It really is as simple as two circles and a cut command. My next design trick is for downward facing hex nut holes over other holes. Again, quite a mouthful, difficult to say, but very easy to explain and show you. As you print the enclosure for the control board, you'll probably find that the best way to print it is like the base down. So as if the PCB is kind of on the print bed, but obviously the actual PCB is not there. So you have the widest, generally the widest face facing down. But you're also probably going to be screwing through your control board to nuts on the other side, which means you may have a nut recess in the back to make that assembly process easier. This is something I do a lot. However, the problem here is you've now got this nut hex feature facing downwards, and it's very difficult for the printer to draw that. We don't really want to fill it with support material because it's just a pain to remove, especially with PETG that prints quite hot, it gets stuck to itself very easily. So it tries to bridge. But if we look at the slicer here, we can see that the bridging operation doesn't go all that well. There's two circles in the middle there, it's just drawing onto nothing. So this trick basically involves manipulating how the bridging process is happening in order to not have weird features that it can't draw. So to do this, identify where your hex or nut feature is and start a sketch on the base of that hex. On that sketch, you want to draw two lines that are parallel to each other and also make them tangent to the hole which the screw is going to go through. Then do the cut command and cut the two shapes that are either side of the hole between the lines. Next, we want another sketch on the new face that you just made and make two lines again parallel to each other but perpendicular to the first two. This time you want to cut out the four small triangles that are placed around the hole. Technically they're not triangles, but they look kind of like triangles. The distance that you want to cut each time is going to be equal to your layer height. So if your layer height is going to be 0.3 millimeters, then cut 0.3 millimeters. If we take that geometry now and go and look at it in the slicer, we can see that instead of trying to draw weird features in places that it's not gonna really succeed very well, instead it has this bridging section in one direction, just straight across, very easy. And then it bridges in the other direction, again, straight across, very easy. And then a couple of features in the top, which are much, much smaller, even though they are still a little bit complex. So it's not perfect. We're trying to bridge a hole with absolutely no support here, but it's a lot better than it would be without doing this. It generally means that you can take the print off the printer and put the nuts in straight away with any other processing, which is really helpful. My seventh and last tip for today is to try not to overdo it with tolerances for cables. Cables are very bendy and flexible. They can go in many, many places. So don't worry too much about the exact sizing and holes that you want to try and pass them through. Especially don't try to make specific routing points for each every individual cable and zip tie each one cable individually. It's just not worth the effort. Imagine where they're going, create some zip ties that can go in that rough location and I'm sure your cables will comply. They generally do as they're told. A great example of this is where you might try and thread a cable through a hole. Again, this is a very tight tolerance feature you generally want to avoid. If the feature is too small, your cable just won't fit. You either have to drill out the hole or do some sort of modification to make it fit. A better method would be have a larger hole. This means that your cables are almost guaranteed to fit, even if it wobbles around a bit. That little bit of wobble is probably going to be fine. And you could have, of course, add a zip tie feature somewhere there in order to fix it down afterwards. The best way to do this though would be to have a slot all the way from the side of the part so you can slide the cable in even once it's got connectors on both ends of that cable. Just little things like that, not overdoing it with the tolerances around cables and their paths, try to make it easier for yourself. 
You never know, if you change the design a little bit further down the road, you might be happy that you made something a little bit larger because that can then cope with your modified design. Now the design's all sorted, we just need to print it out and attach it to the printer. A very simple process, we've got all the features there that we need, it's just a very simple assembly. So that's going to be it from me today. In the next video, we're going to take a look at some more CAD skills for designing enclosures for TFTs. Some parts, of course, similar, but I'm not going to repeat anything. There's going to be a whole new set of useful tips for designing for TFT screens, touch screens, enclosures, that sort of thing. So of course, you don't want to miss that. Make sure you hit subscribe, like the video if you liked it. And I think that's it now. So thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.